Hey everybody, welcome back into this beautiful Zoom room that is really a magic room. I don't want anybody to know that really, but it, what happens is magic happens in this room. And I'll tell you why I think that happens, although I have no idea why it happens. In this room, the only intention I have is to love and accept the people that come in, to listen to them and hear them, and to acknowledge them and validate them for what they're saying. I'm not most likely going to believe everything that people say in this room. It's okay. That's fine. It doesn't mean they don't have the right to believe what they believe, right? Mm -hmm. And in my 65 years of life, no one's ever said to me, Danny, you have to believe like I believe. And yet I look out into the world today and I see a world that's very divided by beliefs that they have. And so what I want to do is just create a little window for people to look into where beliefs have nothing to do with who people are where I love people and accept people and, and, and acknowledge them. Some of my best friends have the most crazy beliefs you could ever imagine. I would never believe what they believe, but I would take a bullet for them because I love them that much. I don't love them because of what they believe. I love them because of who they are. Let me fulfill my obligation to my sponsor, which is the Mosaic, the book over my left shoulder. It is a book that I wrote. It's based loosely on the story of my life. It's about a boy who loses his parents two years apart on the same day. And when he asks the adults where his parents are, they tell him they're in a place called heaven. So he sets out in search of the place called heaven, walking the streets, looking for where it is. He, he doesn't know if it's a store, a person, a thing. But the people he runs into are not what he would initially believe are the people that could show him heaven. And so he wonders, why am I meeting these people? Because they're common, ordinary people. But he says, I don't have anything else to do. I'm here. I'm just walking. I'm trying to find my way around. And so with that in mind, he says, I might as well just sit and listen to these people and hear what they have to say. And in every single case, when he listens to them tell their story, the person he sees is entirely different than the person he first saw, the first person he came up to. And that isn't because the person that he sees has changed, it's because he's changed. He realized that his preconceived notion of who someone was, was getting in his way of actually seeing who they really were. And when it happens over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, he looks at himself and he says, I wonder if I see anything in this world the way it is, or if I see everything the way I am. And when he slides himself out of the way, he looks over to the right and he sees a monk unzipping the sky and inviting him into a parallel reality where he meets the wise one who's the keeper of the mosaic. If you like the way the story has unfolded till this point, you will love what happens after he goes through the parallel reality and meets the wise one. If you would like that, if the book's available on Amazon or on my website, I welcome you to get it. I would love to get it and I would love to hear what you feel. The obligation to my sponsor is over. Now, the, my obligation is the person, this beautiful woman sitting in my room with me. Her name is Nancy Han. Nancy, welcome to the conversation. How are you today? I am fine. Thank you so much for having me here, Danny. What, a, what an interesting, awesome project you're doing. The book sounds fantastic. I'm, thank you. I've, I am going to get myself a copy of that. Oh, thank you, and thank you, and thank you. That, uh, I, uh, my sponsor will be very happy to hear that. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> so thank, thank you so much. Why do you find this so interesting, what I'm doing? Because it is, um, and not, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing this is the universe at work, but not too far from what I'm doing, not what I'm doing, but you're in line with what I'm doing, which is, um, and, and we'll get into it, but my entire um, life right now is focused on friendship. Oh. And, and how that, how that fabric holds us together. Oh. So we definitely want to know more about that. Mm -hmm. And we definitely want to hear a lot about that. But because I don't know who you are, and I can't introduce you, like if I have my, when I have my podcast, I research somebody, I give a big bio. But the whole idea is of this is two strangers come into a room not knowing anything about each other. So I can't do that. So tell us a little bit about who you are and what's important to you. Okay. Um, I'll give you the professional spiel first, which is um, 
I am a retired intellectual property and contract lawyer. I also worked in mediation and alternative dispute resolution. Um, I did that until around 2006, which I had Hurricane Katrina disrupt my law practice in New Orleans, moved um, to Alabama. And right before I was going to take that Alabama bar exam through a strange happenstance, that one person in the room, I took a turn toward teaching people in the corporate world how to how to get inter, you know, interpersonal communication skills, rapport skills, and negotiation skills, and sort of just demystifying that. So most of what I've done, including coaching, has involved helping people come to agreement. And so uh, about two years ago, I had a little tap on my shoulder to talk about friendship, and I blew it off. I was like, ah, yeah, nobody's going to care about that. <laughs> like, come on now. Because that's like, it takes a back seat to romance and professional networks and family. It's, friendship kind of gets the back door sometimes. But um, about a year and a half ago, I started doing some research and what I found kind of alarmed me. And I realized that maybe there was something more there, something more to talk about. And so in December, I started my own podcast. I started recording it and I put that out to everybody in April. And it's funny because it was quiet for a minute and then, and then it started picking up because Loneliness is a real thing. And the, the people who you would, you, when, when you think of a lonely person, you think of that one person staring out the window or something, but that's not it. Yeah. It's, it's people who are surrounded by people, people who have office friends and a lot of contacts, but just nobody close. And so it's a loneliness doesn't look like we thought it did. Yeah. And so, and personally, I just like having friends around, honestly. And I have had, Friends saved my life literally three times. And that's where I am right now. So I'm coming off a life of connection and communication and negotiation and networking and stuff into just what I really and truly think is the apex of everything, which is friendship. If we can get that down pat, then the networks and the good agreements that last and all of that will come. And it's all about that approach. I love that because every show I end is with a challenge to people to reach out to someone they don't know and have a conversation with them and listen to them. Because mm -hmm. when they do that, people become friends rather than strangers. And a friendly world is a much better place to live in than a strange world. Yes. Right. <laughs> and so I feel completely in tune with what you're doing. And, and I also want to say that some of the loneliest times I've ever been in have been when I was surrounded by a large group of people. Mm -hmm. So loneliness has nothing to do with proximity. Like we're, we're cloistered for COVID-19 now. Mm -hmm. I haven't felt a day, a moment of loneliness in that, in that time. Um, but sometimes I feel lonely amongst the throngs of people. Mm -hmm. What do you think it is that makes someone feel lonely? I think it's a, it's a combination of being misunderstood and to a degree, some self-consciousness, because uh, the more people I talk to about this, and I, I'm a dyed-in-the-wool extrovert, but I've, I can thrive without anybody around for a long time. So when they say somebody gets energy from being an extrovert, it may be because they get into to a, a state where the internal dialogue is calmed, quieted, so that you can actually pay attention to the person in front of you and communicate. And I think that a lot of loneliness, the disconnect is maybe some self-consciousness, some worry, some internal dialogue, wondering, are they going to like me? Am I good enough? Um, you know, do I look fat? <laughs> you know, all these things we're, we're checking ourselves to make sure that we're accepted and in the process, building a wall right there between people. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you think we build that wall because we're scared of what people are thinking or do you think we build that wall because of what we ourselves are thinking about ourselves? Well, it comes back to beliefs. <laughs> you know, do we, what do we believe about the world? How do we believe we'll be received in the world? Um, are are pe people like me? Can, can I do things like this? Will it be okay if I do this thing? Yeah. So I had, I had an interesting realization in my years alive. And that was that I used to think that I was worried about what you would think of me. Mm-hmm. But when I stopped worrying about what you, th you thought of me, I still had the demon inside of me of what I thought of me. Right. And, 
And the wall that I built was around myself because I found that I was sabotaging myself so often. So I was constantly hitting myself. And after hitting myself a few times and having it go through, I put up this wall. Mm -hmm. And the wall, look how close that wall is to me. And I don't know if I'm going to hit myself in my face, in my gut, in my groin, in my legs. So I created a silo that's two millimeters around me that I walked through life. And I wondered why there was no intimacy in my life. Yeah. Because there was no, no place for someone to see me because I had created a wall to protect myself from myself. And what I realized is in that moment where the way to take down that wall for me was when I started practicing kindness to myself. When I no longer hit myself, I didn't need the wall up. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you? That makes perfect sense. And, yeah. and, and consequently, I might see you and put a wall up, but now I know the way to take down that wall is to be kind to you. And when I'm kind to you, then we can slowly, brick by brick, take down the wall that exists between you and me also. Yes, exactly. And not too off on a tangent, but I I've, I've, have had experience with, with animals and horses in my past. And I follow some people who are just extraordinary um, I won't even call them trainers. They're understanders. Yeah. And he would like that actually one of them. And, and to the, the level of kindness and empathy and understanding that you really have to have with a thousand pounds of can really kick your butt. Yeah. Um, but people still try to control and make them do things. Once you get that, once you get the give and take and the trust built and that, that kindness corridor, then, then they will hang the moon for you. They want to please. And I think people also want to please. But um, I also do think that a lot of people who are natural connectors, and I was one of them, I am one of them, but have had early experiences where it's trained out, teased out, bullied out by a parent or, you know, some other authority figure in life who, no, you don't do it that way. You should do it this way. Don't do it that way. You should do it this way. And we come into adulthood with these rules that have been scribbled by other people on our connection wall and like, yeah, okay, I can't do that. No, no, girls don't do that. Um, I should, you know, and you know, it's an aunt who says this and a sister who says this and a dad who tells you this and you, you've got this bundle of, of shoulds and shouldn'ts and ought tos and getting through that and being able to kind of, kind of unzip heaven, if you will, and find what's really on the inside and everybody but just be yourself. Well, it's not always that easy. I've worked with coaching clients for a long time to unzip that. And it's, it's good if you can get some of it done. Yeah. And then they, you know, you feel like you're standing more in your own shoes and not wearing somebody else's too tight, too floppy, too high, you know, and walk into life from here and connect yeah. to people from here and not from over there. I've been exploring something that I'd love to throw over the net for your feedback on that I'm doing in my life mm. right now, which awesome. is really, <laughs> which has really been interesting. Um, when I tried to work through all the different things, all the places where I was sabotaging myself, it was an endless list. And so I would get done with one and it's almost like a balloon. I would squeeze this part of it and it would all go over here. Right. And, and so it I was, that. Yeah. And so it was a laborious job that never had an end to it, it seemed. And maybe it did have an end. And maybe I, I just, uh, if I kept going, I would find the end. But I started to think, what would happen if I just let go of everything that I believe? What would just happen if I just made room in myself for a fresh new energy of who I really am to come into me? That I didn't need to go about emptying every single thing. I just needed to empty everything. And every morning when I wake up, I empty everything and, and allow this fresh new energy to come in. And every evening before I go to sleep, I empty it again and allow this fresh new energy to come in. And what I find in doing that process is the things I'm able to do now that I've never ever thought that I would be able to do because I never could do them before because I didn't believe I could do them. But now I've let go of those things and suddenly this new energy is, is capable of doing everything. And it's doing everything through me. And I still don't have it down perfect. You know, I still hold on to some things and don't let a full escape go. But most of the time, 
it's it's a pretty simple beautiful process that is effortless more effortless than the effort that goes into trying to resolve everything your thoughts on that i think i think what you're doing is is consciously mindfully purposefully um replicating those those big life changes so if you will like when somebody goes you know has a near-death experience or um goes through just a, a cataclysmic change there there are a lot of people who walk away from that like almost like they've just cracked out of a shell like okay that's done yeah we're going you know that it's time time for the next phase of things and what you're doing in my opinion is is consciously saying okay i don't need to have a, a near-death experience or a cataclysmic change i can take control of this and mindfully begin consciously saying this is this is the change i'm going to make and doing it consistently every morning creates a pattern and by doing that you're you are stepping into each new day really each new day yeah and that's that is and i imagine it's easier now than it was on day two or five or 18. yeah yeah you know it, it, it i thought it was just as easy on day two or five or 15 but i'm seeing now that it's a little less effortless yeah. now right <laughs> but i was naive and thought oh i can do this because the Buddhists have a beautiful saying. They call they call the Buddhist experience, the Zen mind is the beginner's mind. It's doing what you've done a thousand times as if you've never done it before, mm -hmm. and and having that experience. So, what's one place in your life where you've done that? Mm. I, every person I meet, for one, I, I've because I was judged harshly. I had a I had a very you know, alcoholic parent who was harsh. And so I grew up with that shell too, like mm, lay low, <laughs> safer that way. Um, and so over the last probably tw 20 years or so, I have, I have been more adopting sort of the mis trying to be more Mr. Rogers in my, in my communications, more Carl Rogers in my communications so that, so that I can let the person in front of me be who they are. And, and especially when we're in a world that's divided, it, it can be hard. But like you, I have some really close friends. We're diametrically opposed on things that matter. But by the same token, one of them did save my life. <laughs> like, right. okay, wouldn't trade him for the world. Right. And so that's, that's kind of where I do that. Um, things that I see every day that, that are absolutely fresh and new. Um, right now I am growing dahlias. I do it, you know, I don't grow many. I'm not like, I get like two or three blooms a week, maybe, but I photograph them too. So you have, there's a moment of time when they're, when they're super fresh, right? And that's when you had like drop everything, get the camera, put the lights on, go take a picture. Cause it's, that's it. You've got a golden moment. And from that moment, through to more or less when it's wilted away, I photograph the flower in the stages of life. And that always to me is so like, it feels like a portal to nature to me, just to, to, to consciously observe it and appreciate it and show it to other people like, hey, look at this. Hey, look, this half dead flower. It's still beautiful. Look at that. To, you know, it's not perfect, but it's, it's more interesting than it was on day one, you know? day eight kind of cool looking you know yeah it's it's beautiful in its way and so that is at least for me one place in life where you know this one time of year <laughs> grown 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 boom i get this time and then we're done <laughs> fabulous what makes you happy friends <laughs> friends a good party um being on the water being near the water um Dogs, seeing, seeing a master at work, and I don't care what they're doing. They could be putting a watch together or trimming a tree, but to watch somebody who's in their zone, who, who really is on their game, who knows what they're doing, who clearly is in a space of joy doing it. You know, I don't care if they're under the car doing it, but to, to watch a master work in, a, in that space of, of joy and service makes me very, very happy. So if you were locked in a room with nobody around you, would you be unhappy? No. So what makes you happy? 
well, Danny, oh my God, <laughs> I have an imagination. There's that. Um, well, I mean, I basically am locked in a room, but, yeah. but I have, but I have, you know, some interaction locked in a room with, with or without books. When locked in a room. <laughs> it, it, so often people answer questions with the right answers. And I'm not saying you're answering with the right answers, because I believe that's a beautiful answer to you. Your, your, your whole life's around friendships and your whole yeah. life is around seeing people do things. But there, if so many people live their life based on what's happening around them yeah. and thinking the things that happen around them are what make them happy. And when I ask them if they're locked in a room with nothing in the room but themselves, would they be unhappy? They say no. And so then I say, okay, great. What would make, what makes you happy? And I love that you're pondering it for a minute now, yeah, that the answer um, isn't as easy for you as it was before. No. I mean, if, if I'm in a room all by myself, hopefully with a light at least, <laughs> alone in the dark, it, it can get dull. Um, I would... I would spend that time going inside and I would probably be meditating, which is something I don't do nearly enough of. Okay. And, and um, reaching out on, on the other way and in the other way, on yeah. the other plane, on level, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. But, um, and strangely, because of my upbringing, I started, I started doing a pretty sophisticated meditation when I was around seven. Wow. And I, I was able to hold my attention for like 20, 30 minutes at a time. Wow. And that was just something I did. And I do miss that time. So alone, I would likely go there again. What keeps you from going there now, even though you're not alone? The buzz and the excitement of life. I didn't come here to meditate. I came here to play. <laughs> okay. All right. All right, so, great. It's, it's, it, and I, I think meditation is important and self-care obviously is important. And that's part of life. It's part of living. I, I do wish I did more of it. And also I'm finding an enormous amount of joy doing what I'm doing now. Yeah. So, um, so I, I'm sorry. You said that twice that I do wish I did more of it. What prevents you from doing more of it if you wish you were doing more of it? time right now right now it's time and so it, it's not always that way but i happen to be in a pocket a pocket of intense act activity right now wow. of, of a timeline and a, a thing that i'm doing that is that is taking a lot more of my attention and time and effort and everything than i thought it would but it's not a forever thing so i i you know i can condense I can work my butt off for this, for this stretch. It's a sprint. Okay. I and want to invite back to that time. <laughs> good. I want to invite the listener to also ask yourself the same question. Is there something you wish you were doing more of, but you're not doing more of it? Why? What would allow you to do more of what you wish you were doing more of just as Nancy said, and will it be, does it, does it come down to, I will do that when, um, this happens, or can you do that now when this is what, when now is what's happening? If it's something you want, what's important to you? I know take friendship, friendship. You can't answer because you've okay. already told us that. All right, all right, all right. What's important to you? Um, joy. Okay. If you want to get more specific, um, love not specific either um actually actually and we taking the other thing out of it understanding and being being able to look past the obvious the obvious obstacles to having some kind of a mutual understanding about things no matter what it is yeah. that may be the contract lawyer and me talking but but I've, I've, you know, you see things go awry and you th see things go aright. And, <laughs> and it's, it's that understanding and having the ability to put it, put aside some of the fears because most of most contracts and agreements and that kind of thing are really just everybody putting together and putting, putting on paper what they're afraid you're going to do. 
I'm afraid you're going to light fires on the balcony. So we're going to prohibit that in the lease. <laughs> right. You know, I'm afraid you're going to hold my deposit. So I want you to strike this out. But little, it's, it's us not having that understanding on the get go and really knowing each other. Yeah. Let's change it up a little bit. We're going to go to a lightning Shake round it. and I'm, I'm a, uh, I'm a self-proclaimed terrible lightning round person because I have too much curiosity, but let's try it. Bring it. Are you a dog person or a cat person? Dog person. Tea or coffee? Both. But iced if it's, if it's, if it's coffee. You what, what, what? Iced? But, I, it's but iced if it's coffee. Okay. Uh, cream and sugar or black? Cream. <laughs> Conservative or liberal? Literally straight smack dab in the middle but I'm feeling more liberal right now. Okay. Would you say you're shy or outgoing? Both. Depends. Okay. Explain. Um, actually, I'm, I'm outgoing. Woo. That's not me. <laughs> what happened? Because I didn't hear anything. Oh, I'm hearing. I'm hearing an audio. Huh. Are you running an audio? No. Hang on one second. I don't know what's happening. Well, if you don't hear anything, then I can go ahead and talk over it. Yeah. It's that probably something that's running in the background. It was something running. I apologize about that. That's the last okay. question, the last question was. <laughs> oh, um, tell, oh, me oh, how you, tell me how you I, were both shy and outgoing. I had to overcome a whole lot of self-consciousness from growing up and up until or up until law school, I was scared to raise my hand. I would turn purple and I had, I worked through uh, my own internal dialogue around getting up and, and speaking in front of people. Now I can do it. Now I can talk like, I can tell you all about penguins or just, just spin for an hour in front of a group. It's no big deal, but um, I used to be shy. So I guess I used to be, but now so, I'm not. <laughs> so for, people, for people who are shy, who would like to be more outgoing, is there anything you can share with them from your own experience of what happened? Yes, it was, it was me finally coming to an understanding that it wasn't about me. <laughs> and it sounds, it sounds hammy, but, but I, if I'm on, if I'm on stage or if I'm called on to, to ask some, you know, to say something out loud, same with you. The people who are asking you actually want to hear. Mm -hmm. They're not there to judge you. They're not there to make fun of you or poke you or call you names or throw fruit at you. They're there because they have, they have a sense that you're going to speak something of value. And so when I was able to flip it around and go, okay, hang on a second. This isn't about me. How can I make this the best possible experience for them? That was, it was a weight off my shoulders because they weren't there they weren't there to look at me if I would, to see if I was skinny or not, or if I was qualified or not. They knew that. They knew who they were here for. So that this just turned on how can I make this the best experience for them? How can I pack this out for them? Gotcha. And, and that was the key. Have you felt like you fit into life or have you always felt a little bit different? A little bit different. I'm so interested in the responses that I'm getting because I would have thought that question when I asked it, people would say they feel like they fit in and 95% of the people say they feel different. I, I believe it. Why do you think people who feel different try so hard to fit into a box with people hoping that pe to feel the same? I think it has to do with... Um... And I jokingly call it the achiever gene. There's, there's a little bit of, I mean, it, for the people who are, who resonate with that, there's a little bit of, I need to do it right. I have to do it the right way. And when you look around and there's, there's no trail here, you have this creative thing going on. You're like, I could go that way, but there's no trail there. This trail is well-worn. I will go on this one. Mm -hmm. And so we spend probably those younger years trying to assimilate and fit in and and beyond, you know, get on that same trail with everybody else and that you wear deeply here, but this is always calling to you. And this, this thing off to the side, this interest off to the side that only you have, 
feel there's a, a fear that that's going to isolate you from everybody else. You'll be the odd one out. Um, you may fail over here and then, you know, then you, they've shown you, right? But it's, it's also this one, I've got it down pat. I can do it right. I know how to do this. I don't know how to do this over here. So, tell, me, tell me a time in your life where that actually happened to you, where you wanted to go down. You had a path, a, a fork in the road, and you felt to go on the, on, on the road less traveled, but you went on the road more traveled. And tell me what happened. Oh, hang on. I, I don't think I've ever been on the road more traveled. Um, law school was one of them. That, I guess that was one because I didn't really want to do that. I did that because I knew that that was a path to being able to do whatever I wanted to do. It, it felt like a golden ticket to me. And I, I did end up practicing and I enjoyed it. But if I had, if I had followed my heart, that's not where I would have gone. Where would you? Have that gone? was the safe route. I, at the time I had taken a, a, I had a head injury when I was 15. I cracked my skull oh. and I had to relearn how to learn. And in the midst of all that, we had some other stuff going on and I begged my mom to let me quit school. And the condition she put on that was that I take a neuro-linguistic programming course. So I took NLP when I was 15. Mm. And <laughs> it, it, it was, I mean, helped so much me understanding how my, how my brain worked. Cause it's basically the study of how people process and retrieve their own internal information. So, um, I, I was a full-blown NLP practitioner at 16. I could have stopped there, leaned in, you know, gotten whatever credentials I needed, but just go that direction and, and probably be where I am today, but maybe 18 years ahead. Hmm. <laughs> um, but the, the diversion I took has, has turned out to be hugely beneficial for a lot of reasons, mainly because I have seen, I have seen agreements and communication from every possible almost, I won't say every, from a lot of different perspectives, from, you know, from the mediation and from the, from starting things up to trying to fix things when they're broken. I've looked at this, I've walked around that ball and looked at so many different aspects of agreement and communication and how people um, deal with one another and understand one another. So it was a good experience. And also that was for me taking the, the, the tried and true, tried and true road. Yeah. Where, where, and if I could go back in time and change things, would I? I don't know. I would have to really think on that. Honest. What are you most scared of? <laughs> Being trapped underwater. Wow. <laughs> it's not likely to happen, but if you, <laughs> you want to know. Um, that's one. <laughs> Probably dying alone would be another one, you know? Yeah. What are you most excited by? I'm not going to blurt out chocolate, but it came up. Um, <laughs> um, I'm most excited about the future. And I know we're in a weird time right now. And it, it, this, this year has it gotten to a point where it's comical and it's just spasmodicness. I don't even know. I just made that word up. But, but, but watching the collective dump, dump out the garage, really. I mean, it's, it's, this is, I've never felt the type of energy and, and seen people doing the things that they're doing now where, where it's, we've passed through the shock I think, um, collectively to some degree. And there, then there's the, you know, the different stages I think of grief have been happening. And now I think that we're as a group looking at all the, you know, the garage spread out on the driveway, like, okay, what's going back in, yeah. you know, what are we going to do now? Do we even need the garage anymore? I mean, can we just move to Croatia? Is it <laughs> like, like what, what is real now? What matters now? And I think what, I think that in the midst of all this, this reevaluation, we're going to have a whole new psyche develop collectively out of this. And that excites me. Love and hopefully it. it's a good one, yeah. <laughs> but whatever it is, it is, this is, this is the time of, of our world really just, you know, 
pulling all the toys out of the closet going, do we need this? Do we need this? Do we need this? Do we need the closet? Do we need the house? Do we need to live in the city? You know, how cool is that? I love it. What do you hope most will change? <sighs> Personally, I, I hope, I hope that the, I hope that the ability to read nonverbal cues is somehow rediscovered. It's been sliding and slipping and slipping and sliding. And generationally, um, people under a certain age, like Gen Y, are having more difficulty understanding subtle nonverbal facial expressions. And, you know, and after this, we may have a group of kids coming up, looking at emojis going, what does that mean? Right. Is there, you know, in formative years, now they're covered up. And, you know, if, if Jenny says something that upsets, you know, Bobby, we're not going to see it on his face hmm. until he's crying, you know? So that is what I hope changes. I hope that, that as at some point we all put down our devices and look at each other and go, Oh, there you are. <laughs> like I, yeah. see, I see there's hope in your eyes or I see, you know, something bothering you or whatever, but to be able to still tune into that, I'm hoping that doesn't get lost. I'm hoping that change changes. Now you're thinking, look at that. Yeah. And every once in a while, I, you know, I, I allow myself to think, I love that. Um, in the world that I see going forward, I don't see that we're going to put down our devices because they've become integrated more and more into the palms. It's almost as if they're born into kids are born with them in their hands. Yeah. And in fact, they're talking about putting chips into our system so that our devices, oh, boy. so that our devices <laughs> don't really have yeah. devices. And on one hand, I think, Oh God, what an intrusion. On the other hand, I have a developmentally delayed daughter. And one of the things that's happening right now that it's in the process of it actually exists. It just needs to be refined until mm -hmm. it's used as something called a neuro link. Have you ever heard of that? I have. It's, um, it's Elon Musk, isn't it? Yeah. Elon I watched Musk. the thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so for those people who, who don't know, it's literally a, a, a um, they will insert something in the back of our brain that will allow people who are paraplegic to move. That will allow people who can't think to think. They will allow people to see who can't see right now because it will bypass those currents. And when I think, oh God, what a terrible thing to have devices implanted yeah. into our system, you know, that seems like it could be like to someone who has a developmentally delayed daughter who's never been able to speak what she really wants to say. I can't imagine the joy that I would feel in that moment. Your yeah. thoughts? I, I lost my sense, most of my sense of smell. And so, you know, and it, it's one of those invisible things. Like, it's not really a disability, right? Well, it yeah. kind of is. Like, I can't, I bake bread, I can't smell it, you know? Wow. Um, but if I stick my nose down in the coffee, I kind of get a little bit. Yeah. But basically, I would say 80 to 85%, I can't smell it. So for me, I think that would be a delightful thing. I would, yeah. I would and, and a shocking thing too, because I think there are a lot of memories that are stored in smell. And yeah. so I wonder sometimes if it all came back overnight, what kind of a wreck would I be? <laughs> or, or would I, would I just roll with it? Yeah. Just a wonder. I, I wonder what, I wonder how. Do you feel like you're more of a giver or more of a receiver? Giver. I actually, I got called out on that the other day because somebody um, was, um, I was doing a, I had a, I'm working on a project right now and I was, I put something out there, I was doing a live thing and a, a new friend who's, you know, in Australia or whatever, he's like, you did that and you didn't tell me? And I was like, he's like, I've been planning to be there to support you and I thought you'd let me know about these things. And I was like, you know, I, it, it's, to, to be able to receive help is, is also a big part of relationships, to be able to, to receive as well as give. And that's um, when you grow up, especially with a, with a parent or somebody in your life who's, who's you know, harsh or whatever, you, you learn to be a people pleaser. Yeah. And so that's something that it's an old habit that dies hard. And it's one of those things that doesn't come up a whole lot, but when somebody's a little bit offended that you didn't, you didn't let them be there for you, it's humbling, you know? Yeah. 
it's one of the things that I find in the work that I do over and over and over again, that most people consider themselves givers. And most of those people have a very hard time receiving. Mm -hmm. Do you find that true for you as well? I think that's part of that achiever thing again. <laughs> want to get it right. Want to want to be, you know, don't want to be beholden or have, you know, be a burden or anything like that, you know, and, and asking for help and being able to approach people for to ask for help is hard. It's hard. It's hard for, I think, most people. What if it weren't hard? What if it was the most natural thing in the whole world? Yeah. Then, then we would all have a lot easier time supporting one another. So is it hard or have we created a structure around the way we live our life that doesn't allow us to receive because we don't want to be vulnerable? Well, I think the drifting apart lends itself to people not wanting to do things like that just because then it's not the norm. And when we were all living in a, in a, a tribe or a wagon circle, you know, giving and giving and receiving and asking and, and doing and all of that was part of daily life. Hey, can you help me milk this cow? You know, hey, can you help me sew Jenny's wedding dress or whatever? That was normal. And now we've become detached to a point where it's not normal anymore. Yeah. And, and everybody's so busy. You don't want to, oh, well, you know, I know so-and-so has got so much going on. I really wouldn't want to, you know, bother her. But back in the old days, we all kind of knew what everybody else was doing. And there was, there was a, a more relaxed attitude around the giving and the receiving. What would it take for you to be able to receive a little more than you do right now? I have already developed an awareness around it. That's the first thing. And and to be conscious about it and to ask, which I have been doing more of. So. Fabulous. <laughs> Fabulous. Um, I guess part of the interesting thing is I'm, I want to create a revolution of listening. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people like the idea of listening and, and hearing more. But to people who don't know how to receive, Listening is a hard thing to do because the very action of listening is receiving another person into your life, into your life. And I, and I find that they're, as much as people want to listen, they have a hard time receiving. Your thoughts? I'm thinking about the framing of the question. Um, my, uh, when you were saying that, um, what popped into my head was when I work with coaching clients, I shift into a different, a different person and not in a different person, of course, but, but my, my way of communicating shifts so into more of a listening mode because it, it really and truly is all about them. And with, with social interactions, it's more of a give and take, I think, but what, what you're saying makes a whole lot of sense because right now, considering that the topsy-turvy stuff strewn out on the driveway world we're living in, more people need to have that, that time, that validation, and that moment to be able to be heard. They might not be getting anywhere else. So as part of our new way of communicating and really learning what this is all going to be about, it's the yeah. only way we're going to learn is by listening to each other because again we're we're starting a whole new dynamic like things are they, they're never going to go back to whatever was before what do you think that and new <laughs> dyna what do you think that new dynamic is i don't think anybody knows that's why it's exciting hopefully it's it's some you know i think gene roddenberry had a good idea you know, if you look at the, if you look at the Star Trek timeline, we're kind of right on track for what he had laid out. So it would be 2026, we would have the, the big war and then uh, we'd all split off into our pod tribes and then develop warp drive and meet the Vulcans. So that's one thing we could do. Um, <laughs> you did not expect me to pull out Star Trek. No, I, and I'm not a big Star Trekkie. So, <laughs> but like, I have, an, I have an idea of what the new model of the world looks like. Yes. Do you mind if I share it with you? I would love to hear it. Um, we live right now in my mind in a vertical reality. 
where we fix people, we coach people, we help people, we change people. We, and I think if we were to ask us, independent of what we do, is anybody broken? Most of us would say, no, not really, you're not broken. You just, you know, we just somehow, and I used to be a fixer and a changer. I mean, I'm a guy for God's sake, you know, you tell me a problem and I, I'm, I've got originally, I, I was taught in the seminary that I went to how to walk into a perfect room and see 10 things that are wrong with it in 30 seconds. And I thought, I thought, wow, that's, you know, what a beautiful skill that is until I thought, boy, that really messed up my life because now I can't walk into a situation without noticing what the things are that aren't right with it. And it's taken me a lot of years to sort of just love and accept the things that are in that room, the people that are in that room without seeing what's wrong with them or what great thing for a business to be able to walk into a business and be able to see what's not functioning in it. Well, in a, in a well-run business, but not such great thing for when you want to interact with people and, and see that. And so what I think is going to happen, and it really came to me through the mosaic in a mosaic, there is no vertical reality. It's all horizontal reality. Mm -hmm. No one's teaching anybody. No one's training anybody. No one's showing anybody. No one's guiding anybody. Nobody's fixing anybody. The, the sheer action of a mosaic is pieces come together and in the coming together, they experience something more beautiful than they had on their own. And there's a sharing that happens when we come together that isn't verticality, that is just acceptance and love. And I wonder if... When I listen to you speak, and please, this is just for clarity, not for my ear hears a lot of things of teaching things. You know, you are, you are a great teacher and, I, and your points are really well made. And you, you've been in the profession of being in law where you're pointing out to people what things are and mediating. What would happen if you didn't need to teach anybody anything? And grow flowers. And dahlias. More dahlias <laughs> or other flowers? <laughs> I don't know. There are a lot of flowers out there. <laughs> what would that feel like to you, to, be, to just be able to grow more flowers? Probably not the answer you're looking for, but... Um, I'm, not a, I'm, I'm looking for the one you want to give me. I don't believe it's what you would really do, but I believe it's a, it's yeah. a, it's a quick answer. Um, but I don't believe it's what you'd really do because I think you love people and care about people too much to just sit and grow I would, flowers. I would be teaching. This is what I love to do. I'm doing what I love to do. Got you. You know, and, and if I can make the road smoother for anybody, that's what I'll do. Why is that so important to you? So did, did someone make the road smoother for you at one point? Yes. Oh, you don't, don't go make me cry. <laughs> I, I had I had two completely different parents. One was a one was a narcissistic alcoholic litigator, and the other was the love child of Merlin and Martha Stewart. She was a beautiful, perfect soul, and for as much as he beat up on us emotionally, she would put us back together again over and over and over and over. And without her, I'd probably be in the gutter, addled, but because of her, I've instead, um, actually, she, she fostered things that, that lit me up. She saw that I, I took to art, I got art supplies. If it, was, if it was something that was, that she saw that was true to me, horses, art, photography, um, growing things, um, she, would, she would lean in and foster that. And so she made the road possible for me. I won't say it was smooth for anybody, but she made that road possible to me. Um, and a lot of people out there who would be natural connectors, who would be um, the fabric of friendship in this world have had that natural tendency beaten out, teased out, unlearned. And for me to go and, and say, here's, I understand what's happening here and let me, let me show you that we can smooth this road out for you. So I've been there. I've done that in, in a big way. Um, you think they wouldn't find that without you? 
They might, they might, but, but I would have loved someone to guide me and I'm glad I had someone who did, Yeah. you know, but I wouldn't have much to offer, but for her, that's true fact. Yeah. So I love when people make those statements because I think if her wasn't there, another her would have come. And they might have done it and they might have done it in a different way. So I don't think, I think who we are and who we're intended to be is always going to be what comes and, and people come in our, come into our lives to help us be who we are when we can't be who we are on our own. But if no one was there, I believe we would become who we are anyway. Well, that may be true, but how many people really self-actualize actualize on this plane in this life? Yeah. Yes, maybe I would make it, maybe I would be where I am now, but, you know, without her, but I think this stage might be 10 or 20 years down the road. Yeah. Had I, had I not had that guidance. I understand. I think that's great. Yeah. Do you believe the world is speaking to us right now? Do you believe in the midst of all this chaos we're in, the pandemic, civil rights movements, Me Too movements, institutions crumbling? Do you believe it's saying something to us? Fires, floods. Is it end of times, you mean? No, I mean, it I, looks I, like it sometimes. I mean, I, I'm more asking, first of all, the, pur- the purposeful <laughs> question is, do you believe that the things around us and the world around us, do you believe our bodies speak to us? Do you believe our businesses speak to us? Do you believe things around us speak to us? It's an interesting question. Because when you first said it, I was thinking earth. And I think earth actually might be speaking to us. Yeah. And, and what if, if instead of looking at it as the world, looking at it as earth, earth has responded to us in a way that has caused us to, to begin responding to each other hmm. in, in ways that might actually eliminate some of us and help earth. And the pandemic, as we've seen, has been kind of helpful to earth in some ways, you know, Um, from South Louisiana, originally watching hurricanes pound like this is unreal. And it's hard to look away and think that earth isn't talking to us. Earth is definitely talking to us. (laughs) Yeah. What do you Um, think it's, what do you think it's saying? What do you think if we would listen to it, we would hear? Um, I don't know. Knee jerk is there are too many of us. So you think it's just a cleansing process, all the stuff that's happening? We've been abusive. You know, we don't need to t- take the tops off mountains. You can't put those back. <laughs> you know, you, we don't need to drill big holes. There are other ways of doing things. I think nature did. Personally, I think nature provided us with ample, ample sources of, of power if we needed it you know, with, with solar power and wind power and, and hydro, hydroelectric, but um, we've, we've, we took another tack on that. And I think that what we've done to earth has been abusive. So and, with, say that, say it's true that what you say, what you're saying is true. What would the earth be saying to us now as its inhabitants? I've never spoken for earth before. So <laughs> yeah, I'm not asking you. I'm just asking you what, what do you think earth is saying? Let's, let's put it this way. What do you think earth is saying to you? Be mindful, be mindful, be mindful that, that, that there is a, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction for everything you touch, every hole you dig, every branch you break, um, every, everybody you're short with, cranky with there's a reaction there's there's it's not nothing stays just with you even in that little room put me in that little room my mind would go out (laughs) you know yeah i just i just go a different way but but for every everything we do we we set off a cascade of other things like it or not it's just a thing yeah so be mindful of what domino you're tipping yeah what you're doing and what you you know know that there's more on the other side of that and it doesn't stop with you you know driving down the street 
everything has an, a, a reaction to it. So that's my best guess for what I love it. might, might want to say. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy, thank you for taking your time to be in this room. Cool. Um, thank you th for having me. Thank you for sharing of yourself so freely. Um, for those of you who listen to the show, I, I want you to really take a listen to what Nancy's saying and, and to feel what you feel. What do you feel from the conversation that we've had? What do you feel Earth is saying to you? Um, what, what do you feel about being here to help a world see something more, just letting the world... I love the Tao Te Ching. It says, left on its own, the Earth would be perfectly fine and would correct everything that is broken. Mm -hmm. um, and do you believe that, do you trust enough in the world around you to know that it can fix itself and the people around you to know that they'll find their way on your own? Or do you really have a kind heart that says, I want to help them uh, save five years of their life, 10 years of their life by being there to help sh bring a shortcut something for them by helping them see something? Or do you believe that you don't really need to do that? They'll find it in the same amount of time, the same thing on their own. Just interesting questions for us to think about as we go into where our place in this, in this life is and what we actually believe and think. Um, again, if you like the show, please share it with people that you like. And I want to end this show with a challenge that I give every single time. I didn't know Nancy from Adam or Eve when she, <laughs> five minutes before she came into the room. But we've had a beautiful conversation and I feel like I know her a little bit more. It's not that hard to become friends with people who are strangers. No. Why not reach out and find someone who you don't know and just ask them to tell you about themselves. Listen to them. Don't try and fix them or change them or help them or do anything. Just listen to them, tell you their story. And in listening to their story, see what happens. Maybe you become friends with people that were once strangers. When we live in a world of strangers, we live in a strange world. Yes. But when we live in a world of friends, we live in a friendly world. And how long did it take less than an hour for a stranger to become a friend? Mm -hmm. Why not invest some of that time and make this world a friendlier world than it is right now by one by one by one becoming friends with each other? It's where we started the show. It's where we end the show. It's what Nancy's dedicated to. If you want to reach out to her to find out about how you can have friendship be a more appropriate, more important part of your life, Nancy, how would people best get in touch with you? They can get in touch with me at www.friendsonhand.com. That's the podcast. And um, www.fohdive.com. Okay. I'm going to have all those things listed. You're going to send me your links awesome. and your all that stuff. All that will be in the show notes so you don't have to worry about getting the spelling right. Again, thank you, thank, thank you folks for coming. Nancy, thank you. Is there one last thing you want to say before we go? Thank you so much for, for having me here. And I will, I will underline and underscore what you just said, which is I, I tell people something similar, which is to reach out with no reason because no reason is the best reason. And I find that's what holds people back a lot. I don't have anything to say. Ah, that's okay. That's the best time. <laughs> so, so reach out. I love that. So until the next stranger comes into this room, folks, be kind to each other, reach out for no reason, um, love one another, and see if you can make this strange world a little bit friendlier by asking somebody how they're doing. Until next time, Thank you for, your, for spending your most valuable asset with us, your time, and we wish you well. Ciao.